Now on Discovery Science, we suspend our disbelief and enter the world of the paranormal to hear some incredible accounts and witness bizarre happenings with Critical Eye. Mysterious circles in the English countryside. Egypt's Great Pyramid. Did visitors from space leave huge markings in the Peruvian desert? Next on The Critical Eye, Mystical Wonders. Neolithic pillars, a pharaoh's tomb, strange symbols in a high desert. Hello, I'm William B. Davis. In this hour of the critical eye, we'll investigate immense and puzzling structures and emblems. We'll examine Stonehenge, mysteries enshrouding the Great Pyramid, and eerie markings at Nazca, Peru. In our first segment, we look at mystery shapes that seem to appear from nowhere. Are crop circles a call for attention from another world? A prank turned global phenomenon? or simply the odd way that some plants grow. Enormous shapes carved into living grain fields. Arcane images that cover acre upon acre. They appear to defy logic and reason. Few mysteries of modern times have attracted more attention than crop circles. These huge patterns appeared overnight, etched into the landscape. Circles and other shapes have been cropping up all over the globe. We're talking about a worldwide phenomenon. Crop circles have been discovered in rice paddies in Japan, um, dry lake beds, uh, one formed out in the middle of a clay desert region uh, in Oregon. Ian Christopher is a seriologist, a researcher who monitors and documents the crop circle phenomenon. As of this date, over 10,000 formations have been discovered in 50 countries worldwide going back at least three decades. And those are only the ones that were reported that we know about, so it's understood that there's probably more. Most crop circles today are fairly large. Uh, they've been anywhere from two to 300 feet in diameter to uh, over 1,000 feet in length. The designs originally appeared as simple circles of collapsed plant stalks. From casual reports evolved theories that the designs were made by aliens. That is the idea that a flying saucer would touch down in a wheat field, would leave a circular depression and maybe a swirled circular depression. Pretty soon, however, crop circles began to take on features that had nothing whatever to do with that idea. As time passed, the shapes became more complex. Pictograms pressed into wheat, oats, rapeseed, and barley. Teams of enthusiasts went into the fields, trying to discern the motives and meaning behind the design. Using compasses, dowsing rods, and magnetometers, they assess changes in water tables and measure magnetic anomalies. Because there are lots of places where compass needles do strange things because there are magnetic minerals in the soil, for example. Well, if you are geared up to believe that something wacky is going on in this crop circle and your compass needle does something strange, of course you're going to make that connection. They seem to leave telltale clues for us to discover in our scientific investigations. Uh, water tables being drained beneath the real formations. Electromagnetic residual effects that interfere with battery operated devices. An altered Earth's magnetic field in the formation itself. So there appears to be a real energy that's charging and causing molecular changes allowing the plants to fall into these designs and yet still be healthy and vibrant for the entire summer until they're harvested. 
circle, maybe false, because you could take that compass needle two miles down the road where there's no crop circle, never has been, and you'll get the same thing, and there's a prosaic explanation for it. Based on data they have gathered from witnesses, Christopher and colleagues believe they can trace some circles to inexplicable forces of nature. There's an aerial event where an external source uh, generates some sort of energy that causes the plants to lay down and form these designs. A glowing orb is seen up in the sky. It descends down over the field. Sometimes a smaller ball of light may descend out of it. That glowing object will literally dance over the field for a moment or two, retract back up into this other light, which appears translucent, does not seem to have any particular shape or structure to it, and that just shoots up in the sky and disappears. When the farmers come out the next morning, they find a huge two to 300 foot formation. two gentlemen say is true. In, this in 1991, Englishmen Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley admitted that for nearly 20 years they'd been making crop circles on the sly. We had lovely art forms in field. He said, I can't believe this. It's flat and corn. The patterns apparently started as a prank. People were still swallowing that. D and D is Doug and Dave. Lovely signatures. They used a plank and a, a piece of rope extending from each end of the plank, sort of like a child's swing. Using the tool as a kind of stirrup, the pranksters pressed down on the plants in a circular pattern, creating distinctive forms. The resulting media attention inspired a wave of copycat artists to go forth and do likewise, executing generations of shapes that showed ever higher levels of complexity. They became heroes to an entire underground subculture of landscape artists that wanted to copy and borrow what Doug and Dave did and improve on it. And some of the most spectacular formations that have been found in recent years were filmed and proven conclusively that they were man-made. Ed and Chris Sherwood of Millennium Research have been working together for more than 10 years. Nice. Their studies have shown there's no easy way to distinguish between real crop circles and fake ones. I think we tend to want to find one answer to the whole mystery, but in most things in life, there's usually more than one answer. And in the case of the crop circle phenomenon, there's evidence some are created by people. Some are created by perhaps a divine supernatural force that involves our consciousness and is connected to it. Literal, uh, Chris and Ed compile their research in an office in their Santa Monica home. These seriologists say they found strange physical anomalies in what they believe to be genuine crop circles. These are all examples of our decoding of crop circles and how we break them down. For example, here is one um, that appeared in 1997, and around it I've illustrated different elements, different sacred symbols and meanings that went into this design. You know, many of these are really visual metaphors, they're like holograms, they describe many things in a very simple way. This is an article, an illustration of an article that Chris, Chris wrote a few years ago about observations that she made in 1994 how the Schumacher-Levy 9 comet that was at that time impacting on Jupiter, this is the image of the largest impact, the G-impact, the largest comet fragment that hit Jupiter. And just after this occurred, this formation appeared in the field in Wiltshire. The first time I gave a talk presentation, it was in Glastonbury, and I was explaining to the audience this connection that I had discovered between the comet collision and this formation, and that very night, dead center on the spot where this one appeared, this one appeared. I was completely overwhelmed. I knew it, it was a direct interaction. I knew throughout my whole being that we had gotten a response. 
they're not in the solving anything business. They're not in the investigation business. They, uh, most of them, don't even try to offer much of a hypothesis. Many of them are just, this is a wonderful mystery that we ought to study. On the ground, it's a tremendously complex looking formation. The Sherwood spend time examining fields firsthand in Europe and the US. One there, underneath another. They feel there's a link between energy forces in the universe and the forms created in crop fields. In science, it would perhaps be described as a, an atmospheric plasma, uh, a ball of ionized, electrified airborne gas and water vapor bound by a powerful magnetic field emitting high frequency sounds generating a very powerful electrostatic field. And if one of these temporary things were to descend into a wheat field, it would have very dramatic effects. The Sherwoods attribute the plasma to a higher intelligence feeding off the collective energy of the human race. Genuine crop circles are being created through our collective consciousness and being guided by an infinite intelligence. Without first establishing a scientifically sound model of a crop circle, scientists conclude that only the man-made explanation can apply. We don't have a single one that's absolutely unquestioned that we can say, okay, this is what a real crop circle's like, and now we can compare the questioned ones to see if it has those characteristics. They're all questioned. And so when people start saying, we can sort out the real crop circles from the others because these have this characteristic and these don't, they don't have any basis to do that. With their dramatic size and ever-evolving form, these mysterious shapes continue to pique our curiosity. A seriologist press for the reality behind crop circles they take heart from the fact that such designs appear by the hundred each year. Once people start with a belief and work backwards to the evidence, which is exactly opposite of how science works, we have a name for this kind of approach that these seriologists take. It's called pseudoscience. There is the claim that these uh, patterns are too elaborate or too complex for human beings to make them. That's been clearly refuted. But I think crop circles could have been made by aliens. I don't think there's any relationship. I thought that it was a big hoax. They are such a strange phenomenon. And they have proven ways that guys, like one guy, could actually do that. I find them deliciously mysterious. Elaborate circles in the grain continue to crop up all over the globe. But until scientists find some evidence that these forms are alien in origin, we must imagine that they're the result of pranksters or, or botany. Stonehenge. The term literally means hanging stone. For 3,000 years, these stone circles have spurred theories about their origin and purpose. But at the root of all that speculation is awe. Certainly Stonehenge is one of the great wonders of the ancient world, and I think even in the modern world, it stands out on its own as extraordinary. It's a, a spectacular monument. It's a testament not to anything paranormal, but to the skill, to the ability, to the passion of ancient people to make something that's bigger than they are. The construction of Stonehenge began around 1800 BC and spanned over 400 years. The builders hauled blue stone monoliths, some 30 feet long and weighing 50 tons, a distance of 20 miles, then arranged them into concentric circles. Scientists maintain primitive Britons built Stonehenge in order to monitor the seasons and the movement of the sun. Placed to the outer ring of the monument is a 35-ton heel stone monolith. 
For centuries, it has cast a long shadow into the heart of the Stonehenge during each summer solstice. But how did Stonehenge Britons know how to construct such a precise monument to the heavens? Archaeologists theorize the answer to this mysterious design lies in centuries of observation. The sun doesn't rise arbitrarily on the horizon. It doesn't change from year to year. It's always the same. They figured out this very difficult cycle, this very sort of complex cycle. You have to, you have to do data analysis. You have to do science, observation, for a period of time to see that, hey, you know what? That cycle continues. And they follow that through, and they make a monument recognizing that fact. There's still some debate as to the impetus for Stonehenge. Some believe that the builders didn't act alone. We think extraterrestrials visited Earth in the remote past, that Stonehenge was built with the assistance of the extraterrestrials. The extraterrestrials themselves did not build Stonehenge, but the machinery that human beings had access to was extraterrestrial. People who were living in England 5,000 years ago are as smart as we are. They have the same size brain, the same number of neural connections, they're as bright as we are. And think about probably some of the same things we think about. How could they have managed that? They managed it because they were very intelligent people, very intelligent people who had time on their hands because their primitive way of producing food gave them extra time and the desire to produce something beyond just themselves. Oriho Zukulos chairs a group that studies the possible influence of alien intervention on human structures. Anybody who is familiar with architecture or engineering understands that in order to build something, you need to have blueprints, you need to have something in writing that shows you this part goes here, this part goes there. The bottom line is, is that those Stone Age people did not have the written language. So there were no blueprints or sketches to follow, or were there? It doesn't take any tremendous leap of intelligence or ability. And so the fact that anybody would say, well, they needed a blueprint to build Stonehenge doesn't make any sense. Zuccolos believes aliens formed an alliance with a primitive people living on the Salisbury Plain. They were teachers. They were not conquerors. They were teachers. They came here. They saw that intelligent life was present on this planet, yet not technologically there yet. So what they did was they gave us a gentle push in the right direction. But Stonehenge isn't the first megalithic monument. It's one in a series of these things, and there are all these, these stages of development. And it happens over a very long period of time. If extraterrestrials brought down the blueprints for Stonehenge, they sure took their time in actually perfecting it. Archaeologists have found the remains of over 900 stone circles and other megalithic monuments in the British Isles and Ireland. With the use of radiocarbon-14 dating, many of them predate that of Stonehenge. The notion that the structure of Stonehenge is too precise, too well calibrated, to be accounted for other than by way of some alien influence is balderdash. Those who so theorize cannot imagine, but there have in the course of history been so many individuals who have done things which are unimaginable. One author suggests Stonehenge may be a window that opens onto biblical prophecy. Bonnie Gaunt theorizes that the stone's geometry fits descriptions in the Bible. She uses a mathematical method called gematria to support her assertions. Gematria is actually a Greek word which describes 
the process of number substitution for the letters of not only the Greek, but the Hebrew alphabet. And since the ancient Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, then we can take every letter and every word in the Old Testament and assign a number value to it. And we can do the same thing with the New Testament because the New Testament was written in Greek. Using Gumatria, Gaunt believes that she has deciphered a message encoded in Stonehenge's dimensions. This is an illustration of Stonehenge. This is the outer circle of stones called the Sarsen Circle. The mean circumference of the Sarsen Circle is 316.8 feet. The circumference of the box around the Earth is 31680 miles. Now if we go to the New Testament and take the name Lord Jesus Christ, and we assign the number equivalents for each of the Greek words, we get Lord 800, Jesus 888, Christ 1480, and together they add to 3168. I don't believe it's a coincidence that the numbers all match. Ultimately, the beauty about Gematria is that it allows an almost endless range of interpretive possibilities. If you put the letters together with the numbers, because letters have numerical values in some languages, then the sky's the limit as to what you can figure out with them. When I first realized the relationship between the name Lord Jesus Christ and the circumference of the Saracen Circle of Stonehenge, I not only was absolutely amazed, but I began to realize that the architect of Stonehenge had to be the creator himself. The folks who say that, that you can find all this um, uh, very interesting, predictive information in the Bible by simply, you know, picking every 14th letter and then pl plopping them together, well, it turns out that you can do that with Moby Dick. This dramatic merger of engineering, astronomy, and culture has created a monument to human achievement. But Stonehenge means many things to many people. It should give us an enormous amount of respect for where we have come from in terms of our own human ancestry, and should also give us pause with respect to the obviously opposite side of that. Where are we going? To dismiss the facts that we have at Stonehenge as mere fiction or mere fantasy or even worse, mere coincidence, to me is not very scientific. We're postulating they built it with the help of extraterrestrial technology. That's the Peace Corps model of extraterrestrials. They come down to help people, because, you know, they're really simple and primitive and backwards and forward. We're going to help them out. Um, it's absurd and insulting to say that. Stonehenge was a group of rocks in the British Isles. I think the Druids built Stonehenge. The size of those rocks, they're bigger than the houses. It's built by a culture that needed to mark time. I don't think it was aliens doing it. It's just mysterious to me, and I connect to aliens automatically. The pillars of Stonehenge may spawn outlandish theories about religious significance and visitors from other worlds, but there's no denying it's an engineering achievement for the ages. On a remote plain in the middle of the desert, native artists went to a great deal of trouble, etching ornate lines into a thin layer of soil. Near the Peruvian town of Nazca, these magnificent patterns crisscross under the shadow of the Andes Mountains. The Nazca lines are long, ruler straight lines, um, certain arabesques and pictorial figures across 30 miles of desert pampas on the plain of Nazca. Some of the lines go for hundreds of miles through the Andes, perfectly straight way. And these lines, in fact, when they come to obstacles like cliffs and things, don't go around them, go straight over them. They crisscross, they cut through each other. So Nazca's a hugely interesting, enormously interesting place, 
and it's it is mysterious. This mystery has knotted brows for more than a millennia. But the creation of Nazca lines has proven quite simple. The soft, dark topsoil was brushed back to reveal the lighter sublayer just a few inches from the surface. From this earthen pallet, natives drew ornate lines, often miles in length. Still, no one has been able to decipher the meaning behind the maker's designs. There is no single answer to the Nazca riddle. Adventurer David Childress claims these early Peruvian artisans were also students of earth sciences. There's popular theories that the earth is crisscrossed with um, an energy grid and that energy lines, like the, the Chinese call them dragon lines. These lines at Nazca, some of them at least, may have a similar function where these ancient people were trying to map these earth energies. There are around 50 massive animal drawings in Nazca called zoomorphs. Childress sees their purpose as a celestial offering. Some of them, I do believe, are um, archaeoastronomical and are meant to superimpose a zodiac. Go out tonight, look up the sky, and you see the Big Dipper and Orion the Hunter and Singus the Swan, and that maybe people were doing that as well. They were seeing these images in the sky, sort of superimposing their own view. Well, that's a fish and that's a monkey. And we know the natives did that. In South America, there are different constellations that we're familiar with. They define them themselves. And that some of the zoomorphs, some of these great animal designs, match the constellations, the animal constellations we knew these people had. Some archaeologists believe the Nazca Indians may have been designing their own astrological chart. Symbols used as guides for rituals and religious practices. The early Spanish explorers and colonists of that area wrote about the local natives who used those lines as ceremonial pathways. These may have represented ways of connecting on the ground sacred places that ancient people thought were connected somehow spiritually. One theorist has taken this spiritual explanation for the Nazca lines in another direction. Eric von Daniken, author of Chariots of the Gods, feels the gods the Nazca Indians were dealing with actually were aliens. They made some landings in Nazca, and what is left in the desert are some lines, some traces, like wagon tracks, uh, wheel tracks. Now the natives believe that these are the signs of the gods, and they start to think they wanted to show us this. They wanted that we do the same thing. The natives start to make lines in all kinds of directions, long ones, small ones, thick ones, thin ones, all believing for the gods. According to Van Daniken, the Nazca people mimic the work of aliens, creating similar lines to honor and appease them. He says Nazca priests later encouraged the people to make earthly designs or offerings. And he said, we must show them that we are here. We must show them that we have sacrifices for them. And now in a later phase, in the midst of all these lines, they start to create gigantic figures of fishes and monkeys and spiders and so on. It's a pretty simple explanation to say, hey, people believe that their gods lived in the sky, so they made giant things for their gods to see. That takes fewer jumps, fewer logical leaps than saying extraterrestrials landed on Earth and had something to do with those zoomorphs. These designs, also known as geoglyphs, can measure up to 275 meters. This means they are only fully recognizable from an aerial view. 
Some have argued the scale of these projects inspired the Nazca holy men to create low-level flight to better monitor their art. There was an experiment done in the 70s where a hot air balloon was made out of reed baskets and uh, woven fabrics, all native to the Nazca area. They named this vehicle the Condor II, and a flight was actually made. And they flew in a balloon over the giant Nazca drawings, and then unfortunately it came crashing down and they almost destroyed one of the figures and it was a great boondoggle. Investigator Joe Nickel took it as a personal mission to prove that the Nazca people could have created the shapes without the use of flight or alien intervention. He would create his own Nazca line drawing to test his hypothesis. What I did was to try to duplicate one of the largest of the Nazca drawings. So we picked the giant condor. 440 feet long. We got a very large, flat uh, piece of land to work on and drove a pole at either end to establish a center line from which we were going to do our work. Basically, we reduced it by using a center line and some points, like sort of like a connect-the-dot puzzle when you were a kid. The result? a massive condor on the plain, a modern example based on an ancient practice. Although scientists can reproduce the lines using the same methods as the Nazca people, they have yet to answer the key question, why? Is it just because they're bored and don't have anything else to do? Or is it because there's, there's really a purpose? behind these lines and these figures, and that they are some kind of message or coded instruction or some integral part of their belief system and religion that we don't understand. Most medieval churches are in the shape of a giant cross. Well, you can't see that unless you're up in the air, so why did they do that? Well, they did that because God is up in the air looking down at these churches dotting the landscape and they're all in the shapes of crosses. 2,000 years ago in South America, people thought symbolically and were artistic and created symbols artistically to represent what was going on in their minds. Never heard of Nazca lines? What are they? There are all these lines in the ground. You know, signal to outer space, to God, something like that. Maybe the aliens were there. The local people wanted them to come back again, so they throw those Nazca lines. No, I do not think they're ancient alien landing sites. Astronomical calendar or alien landing zone? No matter what the explanation, the Nazca lines are truly amazing. Perhaps it's just a human compulsion to leave one's mark. Across ancient Egypt, rulers erected monuments to their power. Elaborate stone pyramids designed to mark these pharaohs as gods to their people and to generations to follow. In the Valley of Giza, just outside Cairo, the Great Pyramid of the Pharaoh Cheops, also known as Khufu, stands as one of the true wonders of the world. The Great Pyramid in particular is probably the most perfect and largest ancient building that was ever created. What makes the Great Pyramid particularly unusual is its size, the perfection, and the skill used in building it. The pyramid covers 13 acres and is made of 2.3 million limestone blocks. Centuries of construction are thought to have gone into building the tomb of the great Pharaoh Cheops. 
But in recent years, theories have sprung up challenging the purpose and meaning of the Great Pyramid. The standard view of the Great Pyramid and uh, most of the pyramids in Egypt is that they were tombs for pharaohs. It seems like a, a simple theory. However, no pharaoh or mummy was ever found in a pyramid in Egypt, not even one. The fact that nobody was in there is something that Egyptologists have long been able to explain on the basis of grave robbing. These things have been robbed for millennia before somebody said, you know, these are things worth saving and preserving. Ignoring the scientific facts that no artifacts from Giza or the Nile Valley have ever been carbon dated earlier than 5000 BC, David Childress continues to believe that the Great Pyramid predates Khufu's reign. Nowhere in the Great Pyramid are there paintings of the Book of the Dead or of the life of any pharaoh, which is typical in all tombs of pharaohs. Why wouldn't the pharaoh carve hieroglyphs into it and say, hey, I built this and you better be impressed? And we are. Some historians feel the answer to that secret lies in the extreme vanity of the pharaohs. When you're creating a pyramid, you're creating a stylized mountain. You're creating a means of connecting heaven to earth. I would prefer to see to it that the knowledge of how I accomplished this was lost, and that when I moved on to the next world, that knowledge, so to speak, went with me. Because obviously, if no one there ever after were able to create something like what I created, then my greatness is that much greater. According to Egyptian history, slaves built the giant pyramid by dragging massive stones across wooden ramps, slowly raising the structure over many years. The advancement of the pyramid design has been well preserved in Egypt's archaeological record. The Pyramid of Khufu is the culmination of a process of cultural development and evolution. It's not the first step. If you go to ancient Egypt, you look 6,000 years ago and 7,000 years ago, they're burying leaders in just rock cut tombs. And then 5,500 years ago, 6,000 years ago, that earthen man wasn't good enough, they built mustabas, little square block buildings over the burials. Fader believes improvements on these early models led to the work in the Valley of Giza. It is the culmination of a series of experiments. If you look at the end point of an experiment and say, wow, how could anybody have done that? Well, of course, you look at the steps beforehand that show how they perfected the technology. The Great Pyramid has long frustrated those attempting to unravel its many riddles. Egyptologists hold that the pharaoh Cheops built it as a monument to himself. But could a collection of ancient texts reveal a different story? Eric von Daniken and Oreo Zoukalos of the magazine Legendary Times believe that obscure Arabic texts confirm that the Great Pyramid was not designed by a pharaoh. They claim the inspiration came from extraterrestrials. When those guardians from the sky, as they're called, descended from the sky, they realized that human beings were intelligent. They picked one specimen of which they thought had the most potential. And they proceeded to teach him in all various disciplines, in mathematics, in agriculture, in astronomy. This individual's name was Zaurit. As the story goes, Sorid was a scribe for the alien visitors. 
he transcribed more than 300 volumes of knowledge about the universe. When a great flood was predicted to strike Egypt, Sorad asked the aliens for help in preserving the library. According to the story, they agreed and provided him with plans to build a protective structure. Sorid constructed the pyramid with his people. He left these, these chambers inside, he put these, his books inside, and then he made the whole pyramid waterproof because he covered every seat with stone plates. Then the flood appeared. If you're going to tell me that, well, maybe the gods of the ancient world were really extraterrestrials, all I can say is, great story. For centuries, Egypt's Great Pyramid has captivated our imagination, a monument to the pharaoh Cheops. The pyramid is large enough to cover seven city blocks. Some believe a structure so immense could have been built only with uh, outside help. Is there more to the Great Pyramid than meets the eye? Author Bonnie Gaunt uses the ancient process of gumatria, which is the calculation of the numerical values given to Hebrew letters, words, or phrases. Through gumatria, she says she can prove the pyramid arose out of biblical prophecy, not alien intervention. The Great Pyramid was designed by the Creator himself as an evidence of his plan for the salvation of man. There are many reasons for that theory. The height of the Great Pyramid, up from its base platform to its summit platform, is 5449 inches. In the book of Isaiah, it says, in that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof for a witness to the Lord. If you take every Hebrew letter in that text and assign their number equivalents and total them, they will add to 5449, precisely the height of the Great Pyramid. Using another set of numbers, Gaunt sees an astronomical connection between the Great Pyramid and the Earth's cycle. The perimeter of the base of the Great Pyramid is 36524.2 inches. Now, if that number sounds familiar, it is familiar. Because 365.242 is the number of days in the solar year. The number of days that it takes the Earth to orbit the Sun. Academics see too many discrepancies, born out of Gumatria and its alphanumeric findings. When one thinks of the Great Pyramid in the context of Gematria, one once again thinks in terms of the infinite way in which numbers, particularly if they're applied to the biblical text, lend themselves to interpretation. If you take the height of the Washington Monument and multiply it by 40, you get the distance to the nearest star in light years. When they built Washington's Monument there in DC, were they thinking of that? Was that intentional? Or do you set yourself up where, look, I have a lot of measurements over here, and I have an infinite number of things that could match to. The Great Pyramid of Cheops continues to challenge our imagination and serves as an endless source of intrigue. It's an engineering marvel and tribute to the people of its time. The Great Pyramid is built by Khufu to immortalize himself in all the senses of the word. It's either the marker of his tomb or not, but it is the symbol of his passage to the realm of immortality. And in being sui generis, the most extraordinary pyramid of them all. I believe until it's really been satisfied how these rocks were quarried, moved, dressed, the mystery will never be solved. The fact that the pyramids are spectacular and splendid 
should do one thing for us. It should cause us to be in awe of ancient people. It has to do with someone who had that kind of genius, and geniuses occur in every generation and every culture of one sort or another. Someone had that inspiration to conceive of the idea, and someone had the charisma to galvanize what was necessary to enact the idea. I don't find that impossible just because it's 4,500 years ago. The pyramids of Giza, the ancient Egyptians built the pyramids. There are burial chambers. They might have been placed here by someone else. It's possible that the stuff could be built. But then again, where did they get the talking technology? I won't be surprised it's, it's connected to aliens. Godlike self-promotion? Or biblical prophecy? <laughs> the pyramid at Giza is pretty big, so maybe it can't help but inspire big theories. The world is full of extraordinary things that seem mysterious. Crop circles, Stonehenge, the Nazca Lines. Evidence of contact with beings from beyond, or catalysts for human storytelling. We'll be back soon with a scientific perspective on extraordinary phenomena. For The Critical Eye, I'm William B. Davis.